Hi and welcome. I am Dr. Pamela Hirstella Pietra, founder and president of Children and Screens, Institute of Digital Media and Child Development, and host of the popular Ask the Experts webinar series. We're delighted to have you uh, join us for our 30th interdisciplinary webinar since the pandemic and its concomitant lockdowns began. Today, we are at an inflection point, a time of transition, adjustment, and uncertainty. Many of us don't know yet what our work lives will look like in the coming year or how our children's schooling can catch up or whether or not we should vaccinate our children or even dine out at a restaurant. One thing is certain, our progeny need our help and support to navigate some serious adjustments ahead of them from returning to in-person learning and reconnecting with classmates and friends to being away from parents and siblings with whom they've spent the last year to recalibrating their social habits and planning summer activities. Where do screens, children's lifelines for the last 13 months fit in? While the research studies are still being analyzed and published now, we have seen firsthand how constant screen time for a year has affected our children's cognitive, mental health and education. Our outstanding group of experts is here to help you understand what we know so far and to help our children overcome the trauma of COVID and move forward in life with better habits than ever before, both on and off screen. As a mother of a teen and an expert in the field, I can attest to the fact that it's complicated and it's important to be aware and monitor your children closely over the coming months. The experts have reviewed the questions you submitted. They'll answer as many as possible during and after their presentations. If you have additional questions during the workshop, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. When you do, please indicate whether or not you'd like to ask, ask your question live on camera if, if time permits, or if you would prefer that the moderator read your question. We're recording today's uh, workshop and we'll upload uh, onto YouTube uh, the video in the coming days. All registrants will receive a link to our YouTube channel where you will find videos from our past 29 webinars, which we hope you will watch as you wait for this video to be posted. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator. Dr. Catherine Steiner Adair is a clinical psychologist and consultant and author of the award-winning book, The Big Disconnect, Protecting Childhood and Family Relationships in the Digital Age. She's an expert in child development, education, and family relationships, and works with families, educators, and others to adapt best practices in using technology while minimizing the risks it poses at school and at home. We're delighted to have Catherine with us today. Welcome. Pamela, thank you. And I just want to take a minute, I know this isn't in the script, to say the service that you have provided, 30 webinars, for parents, for professionals, for people like me who need to learn from other people and other researchers like the ones on the panel with me today has been quite as amazing. And I just wanna thank you because you have really helped so many hundreds of people, parents, educators, and researchers. And it has really been a service. And I know it's been a service of um, love and commitment from you as well as your own research initiative and commitment to kids. So thank you so much. We have a great group of people here today to continue this incredible work. And you know, we, when we started this, Pam, I remember thinking, well, this will just last till the summer. And here we are a year later, Absolutely. And still with us and still confusing. And the summer is coming upon us and we are now beginning to actually get to see a little bit of what it looks like when kids are going back to school and things are changing. So today we're gonna to hear from uh, wonderful researchers and experts in their own areas about how to think about these transitions, how to anticipate them, what we know, what we don't know, what we can learn from what we've been through and how we can remain optimistic and feel efficacious guiding our kids. So, we will begin with hearing from David Schoenfeld. David established and directs the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement. It is located at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. He's also professor of clinical pediatrics at the Keck School of Medicine for over 30 years. He's provided consultation and training to schools on supporting students and staff in times of crisis and loss. And he has been incredibly busy as you all can well imagine since a year ago March and has been helping hundreds and hundreds of people 
around the country. David, thank you. Thank you very much. So what I'm gonna to do today is talk a little bit uh, briefly about how we can support children during this pandemic. And I wanted to start by sharing some data about research that was conducted in New York City public schools about six months after the World Trade Center attacks. And it showed that distress among children after major crisis events is both pervasive and long lasting. Nearly nine out of 10 children attending grades four through 12 still reported at least one reaction persisting six months after the attack. The most common probable mental health diagnoses of the over 8,000 children screened were agoraphobia and separation anxiety, with symptoms consistent with those diagnoses self-reported by nearly 15% and 12% respectively. Even six months later, these students reported anxiety, leaving home and going into public spaces. It's helpful to recall that New York City experienced ongoing threats of terrorism during this time period, which included concerns of anthrax release, another potentially deadly infectious disease that can be transmitted without exposure to someone who's obviously ill. So this therefore has some direct relevance for what we might expect as children return to classrooms while the virus is still circulating during this current pandemic, and after many have been isolated in their homes for up to a year or more. So it's critical that we provide active outreach and support to children who don't return to school uh, when in-person classes are available. And quite honestly, we should be offering support now for those children already demonstrating distress or disengaging from learning. We need to shift from exclusively a medical model, which I hear a lot of people talking about, characterized by screening, evaluation, diagnosis, referral, and treatment for individual children with symptoms of mental illness, and move instead toward a system of universal support, when the school system, those are refer referred to as tier one services. And that should be our primary focus to promote resilience as the main response to the pandemic. This would have to be coupled with incorporating school mental health professionals and referral to community mental health providers to provide additional services from children who actually need or would benefit from more assistance. Now, this pandemic has caused widespread distress among children and adults, but not all of this distress represents trauma symptoms. The challenges facing most children probably relate more to loss than to trauma during this pandemic. Our society has of late grown to appreciate the important impact of trauma on children, resulting in a call to become more trauma-informed. But we have been slow to recognize we must also become grief-sensitive. And the massive number of deaths associated with this pandemic and other losses should prompt us to remedy this oversight. I remember responding to one um, community shooting, and there was a teenager, and the person on either side of him was shot and killed, but he was uninjured and really didn't know what was happening until he was already uh, safer. And when I spoke with him, it was about three or four weeks after the shooting. He had gone back to school once, stayed for an hour or two. He had declined counseling, and he didn't return to school. So I went to his home and he explained that he didn't want to go to counseling because all they wanted to do was to talk about the shooting. And quite honestly, he had some trauma symptoms, symptoms, trouble sleeping, some jitteriness, um, but they had all abated within a week. And so then I asked him, well, why aren't you back in school? And he said, well, it didn't feel right to be there without her. He was on a date with his girlfriend that he planned on marrying. And to be in school without her just didn't feel right. So I said, well, maybe you're, you're suffering from the loss of your girlfriend. And he looked surprised and he said, that's it. And if someone's willing to talk to me about that, I'll go for counseling today. I just don't wanna keep talking about the shooting. But no one had suggested to him that maybe grief was the issue. Mm -hmm. And the interventions and supports we offer to children who are grieving are actually quite different than trauma treatments. When addressing trauma, you're focusing more on the person's reaction to something that happened but support for grief focuses instead on helping people cope with loss, the persistent absence of a person, rather than the way the person died. I served on the Sandy Hook Advisory Commission, and I remember one of the parents testifying in the spring, and she said that she got the yearbook from Sandy Hook, and she opened it up, and she noticed that the picture of her child who had died in the shooting had been removed, as had all the pictures of all the children and staff who had died. And she looked at me and she said, what were they thinking? Mm -hmm. um, why It's as if they never existed. And, and, and I've had conversations with people about this where they've said they've left out photographs in the yearbook because they don't want a trauma trigger 
but they don't recognize that for grief, we do want to remember the people and commemoration memorialization becomes important. So with that background, let me spend just a couple minutes talking about some general advice on how we would support children during this pandemic. First off, don't pretend, don't pretend that everything is okay when obviously it isn't. Children can tell when adults are not being genuine and honest, and they're less likely to ask questions or seek advice when that's the case. Children actually benefit from knowing that important adults in their lives also have concerns and learning from them how to deal with troubling or distressing feelings. We simply can't expect children to share all their concerns when we're unwilling to share that we have concerns at all ourselves. And we certainly can help them learn to cope with distress effectively if we don't model effective coping techniques. But this doesn't mean that adults should share all of their concerns. Adults should briefly share some of the more common reactions they've experienced in the service of being able to model effective coping strategies. For example, a class, my classroom teacher might share how he had some difficulty sleeping the night prior to returning if school had just reopened for in-person classes. But then he felt better after he talked with his wife and realized she too had concerns and they discussed some of the steps that the school was taking to keep people safe. Um, we actually have scripts on our website uh, that you can freely download for educators for the first day back to school, whether it's in person or remote lessons or younger or older students. You also want to find out individual children's fears, concerns or skepticism. Children actually have many different fears or concerns than adults do. And you can't reassure people effectively if you don't know what they're actually concerned of. Otherwise, you probably aren't offering reassurance, but rather you're telling people why you aren't worried. And when two people each talk only from their own perspective, I call that arguing. And that isn't very effective in providing reassurance. We don't wanna tell children that they shouldn't be worried or attempt to minimize their concerns. Instead, we should help them learn to deal with their uncertainty and fear and share with them strategies to deal with uh, distressing feelings rather than pretend that they don't or shouldn't exist. During this time, we should also be careful to watch our media consumption. Make sure it's a healthy diet and don't consume too much. Adults should try to keep informed, but through focused and periodic attention to trusted media outlets or other trusted sources of information. I find it's helpful to recognize there are two main reasons to listen to, watch, or read media coverage during a crisis. One is to be reassured, and the other is to learn practical steps to keep yourself or those you care about safe. If you aren't getting me more reassured by what you're reading, and you aren't learning new practical information about actions you need to take, you already know to wear a mask, stay six feet apart, wash your hands, etc. then it's best to just disconnect from media. That would be television, radio, print, and social media, at least for a period of time. This is actually a good time for everyone to unplug and connect instead with family and friends. We also should be sure to set reasonable expectations and communicate them to children, parents, and educators. Children are simply not going to learn as much schoolwork during this time period as they would have had we been able to keep schools in session and if we weren't in a crisis. It's not just that schools are not open for in-person classes. I've worked with many schools that have experienced mass shootings and natural disasters. And they often reopen schools very quickly after these events, but the students still have trouble learning and teachers still find it difficult to teach. So don't try to keep the same pace of learning or this will overwhelm students and educators, and then their time together will become more of a source of distress than actually a source of help. And I'm gonna warn you now that when schools do resume, we won't be able to catch up and teach everything children missed. We have to recognize that at some level the world and therefore children's curriculum has simply changed. If we're teaching children how to cope with distress and adjust to a crisis, then we're helping them learn life skills that will make them more resilient in the future and more capable of dealing with future adversity in their lives. And to be honest, in the end, those are the lessons that are most important. I'm going to just end with two quick slides and show you some of the resources that you can uh, freely access. This is the website for the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement at schoolcrisiscenter.org. You'll see that there's a banner at the top, it's kind of salmon colored, that has the COVID-19 pandemic response resources, um, some of which I mentioned, but many others. And then this is the website for the Coalition to Support Grieving Students grievingstudents.org, which includes more than 20 video-based modules on a wide range of topics on how to support children who are grieving. So I'm going to turn this uh, back um, 
to Catherine for some questions and discussion. Wonderful, thank you. Such wise words to help us understand what is going on. Questions. Um, okay, how can um, we help kids ease them back into person-to-person -person school, especially those that are showing resistance? Well, I think first off, you find out again why the children, what they're concerned about and why they're uh, resistant to going back to class because you don't really know what it is. It, you might think it's the virus. It might be that, they're, that they've had some bullying um, that's been done remotely or they're anxious about their schoolwork. And so the solution will vary. But if it's about resistance of being with groups of people uh, during a pandemic, then you probably should be going out into public spaces and practicing, um, getting closer to people, but keeping safe. Um, so you don't want to keep kids, you know, in, in an apartment for more than a year or a year and a half, and then just release them into school one morning uh, when everybody says it's time to go back to class. So you'll want to phase in, um, but first start out by asking them what they're concerned about or what would help and help them figure out what would be ways to start to transition. Great. Okie doke. Thank you, David, so much. Now I'm actually going to pick up right there and talk myself more about how we are, what we're seeing now in kids transitioning back to school and how to think about using the summertime as a way to facilitate perhaps an easier transition back in the fall. So transitions seem to be the theme today and it's a good time now to start thinking about how we're going to help our children transition, not just to going back to school right now, but transition to the summer. And it will be a more dramatic and challenging transition this year when school ends because their current schedules and their normal habits of where kids were typically away from us for five to eight hours a day, they have been at home with us for five to eight hours a day. Where they were looking at teachers and playing with their friends and having recess and doing after school sports, they have been doing all of that to the extent that they've been doing it at all on screens and at home. Screens have been an absolute lifesaver. And of course, they come with their own complicated um, fallout. And we can't beat up ourselves or feel guilty for the amount of times our kids have been on screens. Everybody, parents, teachers, and kids too, have been working as hard as they can trying to adjust and keep together in this extremely stressful time. And obviously kids have been spending more time on screens than any of us would wish, their teachers would wish, we would wish, and in fact, they would too. They're the first to say, it's really exhausting. The research suggests that on average across ages, screens, devices, everything except for single game, uh, single player games, kids have spent an average of six to 12 more hours a week on screens. Again, no praise, no blame, it is what it is. It's been unavoidable. Parents are scrambling, we're worn out, we're doing our best. But that's also led to parents, you know, lowering the bar about things that they might not have wanted to before, giving kids access to social media at eight or nine, maybe not waiting till 13. And kids have been playing many more games and having their play dates on screens, which again has been life-saving. But it's also had some fallout because kids are not used to now playing with each other face-to-face, -face, reading social cues, being together in the same way. And it's mitigated against social isolation, but it hasn't strengthened those social develop and emotional developmental tools that only happen in face-to-face -face interaction, which of course doesn't mean that it doesn't happen online on screens, it does. And online learning has been a huge lifesaver, but at the same time, we know that too many hours on screens leads to a foggy brain, it impacts long and short-term memory, you just can't learn as much, you can't focus as much. And kids have had to adjust and become exhausted by the amount of screen time. And the other thing that's really been a struggle for children is when so much of their social behavior is happening on apps like Snap and Insta, these fast paced apps that are designed to keep them on, the algorithms want to keep them on the app as much as possible. They are very powerful neurological stimulants to kids' brains and we habituate to them. If you watch the uh, documentary, The Social Dilemma, it just gives you a beautiful portrayal of how this works, how the human brain interacts with technology. 
And of course, not all of the behaviors that we've seen, the fallout we've seen is just screen-based, as David said. These are traumatic times. The world has been a pretty scary uh, time lately, and there's been so much upheaval, and there's so much more exposure to what is actually going on in the world around us. But just to say briefly, some of the cognitive changes we are seeing in children right now is that their capacity for sustained tension, doing just one thing, not multitasking, but deepening their capacity for singular focus has been really challenged this year. We've seen more impulsivity because they're used to multitasking or task switching. And those stimulants of going from one thing to another to another, and if you're bored, oh, I'll just go on Insta, that gets you revved up and expecting a level of stimulation that normal life doesn't provide and certainly school does not provide. And when kids are texting a lot and doing socializing in ways that aren't video chatting, which is always the best because when we video chat, we are seeing people, we're talking in real life time. And most of all, unlike texting, which eliminates tone of voice, and the ability to see the impact of your words on the other person, which are two of the most essential tools for human relationships. Texting eliminates that. So we've seen kids acting out more through social media. We've seen a lot more um, sadness, uh, social rejection. You know, it's so hard to see everything, every party you're not invited to, et cetera. So there's been some real psychological fallout from the amount of time Kids are on social media, and again, it's been a lifesaver, but there's also been fallout. It's not black and white. You really have to pay attention to what your child looks like in the moment when they get off something, if they look sad, say, oh, you look sad, what's going on? But psychologically, there's no question in the last year, for a host of reasons, as David said, trauma, pandemic, grief, loss, not just big scale loss, but loss of graduation, loss of birthday parties, loss of Halloween, all these markers that children look forward to has led to an increase in anxiety, social anxiety, social avoidance, depression, lethargy, what we call dysthymia, lack of pleasure in life. Things don't give children joy, the things that they used to get from toys. So none of this is surprising. And what's really important when we think about going back to school, even right now, is that we shouldn't expect kids to just bounce back and do school the way that they used to do school. And what we're seeing is, and we're hearing anecdotally already significant challenges for kids in school. And this makes sense. It's not pathological. It is an adjustment reaction to a very, very stressful, year that's been full of, for some kids, different kinds of grief and loss and trauma and violence around them and in the world. So when we step back, what we're seeing now with some kids is that they're really fidgety in school. They can't sit still at a desk. They can't maintain their focus. They were grabbing their phones if they have them. They want their phones in school if they're not even allowed to have them. They expect to have a phone on hand and they become attached like a psychological dependency to their phone. They are sneaking their Chromebook in when their teachers are saying, let's put our books down, our Chromebooks down, because they're so used to the security and the stimulation of being on a screen. We're seeing more impulsivity, kids are interrupting. They're getting up from their seats when they need to socially distance. They're not maintaining the social distance. They're having a hard time taking turns. And other kids are having a hard time self-regulating and just staying on the task. They crave the instant gratification of being on two or three devices at once. And even in little children all the way up through high school, we are seeing a fear of going to school. We're seeing school avoidance because they're afraid. I heard a story yesterday of an eight-year-old who pricked his finger on a paper clip and got scared that the paper clip was somehow gonna expose him to COVID or give him germs that he would then take home and expose his grandmother. We're hearing kids who are afraid to eat because they've heard that restaurants and eating in restaurants is scary. So we see a lot of worries and anxiety, anticipatory anxiety, as David said, panic attacks, 
And these are all really understandable adjustment reactions to this situation. It's important not to over pathologize it or minimize it, but really to meet children where they are. So in some ways, um, going back to school right now has been kind of cold turkey for kids because they're suddenly expected to like be in school. So let's think about how we can use summer and help kids use the time of summer to transition back to school in ways that will help them neurologically, psychologically, and socially reset themselves, their brains, <laughs> their social skills, so they can be uh, more fu function better when school happens. So now's the time to really think about um, what kids normally get out of summer. You know, what's summer all about? So summer is, for, when I think about summer, the first thing I think is summer is a state of mind. And it's a state of mind when you think about sort of the lazy, hazy days of summer. It's a state of mind in the sense that we think about slowing down, hammock time, going for long walks, gazing at the stars. And it's also a really critical time for developmental tasks and things that can happen with us as humans when we do those things. And the biggest one that we need, all of us need, is to reset our brains, to learn how to be in the slower pace of life that is life off of screens, to take breaks from hours of sitting, doing work at our desks, on our screens, for our children to have the time and the freedom to follow their own curiosity, to play for hours on end on something they choose to do when they no longer have to do their homework or do what the teacher says they have to do. So another thing that's so important about summer is that those long summer days encourage us to reconnect with nature. And nature is hands down, being outdoors is hands down the best way to refresh your brain from its connection, dependency, desire to be on screens and to reconnect with your inner self, your own curiosity. So even what you want to be thinking about as a family is what your kids like to do in the summer. And if they can't go to camp, what are some of the things that they do about it at camp and how you can recreate that as much as possible at home and how to use their free time and really how to come up with a family plan and a new schedule, just like kids have a schedule at school, they do much better with a schedule at home but have it be things that really pay attention to bringing things they have done and enjoy doing inside and on screens into the real world and outdoors as much as possible. What are the kinds of craft skills, new life skills, shooting rockets, playing with Nerf guns, water balloon fights, all those kids, things that kids love to do and how can you give them those opportunities at home? And the other thing that's so important for kids about summer, it's about, is summer is a time of free choice. And when children have time to pick what they want to do and make choices, then they get to reconnect with their own inner innate curiosity. And one of the things we also see children doing that's so beautiful in the summer is that they play and they make up games and they cheat and they work through fights over the rules, which is so important for their social development. And they play dress up outside rather than on screens. And there's a world of difference playing dress up in real life than on a screen because you're creating the story and you're buttoning buttons and fine motor and gross motor and you're doing storytelling, which is literacy. And you're discovering most of all that you have this luscious imagination inside of you. And there's something about playing outside that really generates and recharges kids' imagination. And that's also a time where as families, we do summer things like we go for walks and have ice cream and you know, sip lemonade. In other words, we play and we gather together. So some things that you wanna be thinking about as a family is, Talk with your kids about what they really wish that they could get out of the summer. And if they can't go to camp or do the things they normally do, think about how you can recreate that. There are phenomenal 
summer camps available on screens. You can learn about nature, you can learn camp craft, you can build rockets, you can shoot them all that side. Um, and so many organizations are really offering incredibly good paced, educational, fun, summer-like activities for kids. If you can't visit your cousins and get together as a family, you can still play charades on Zoom and have family game night. If your kids have to be inside, think about the ways you can create and bring the outdoors indoors. No matter where you are, no matter where you live, you can hang a hammock, you can gaze out a window at the stars, you can read together the stories behind the constellations. You can sleep in a tent in your living room. Summer is a time for us all to think about how to reset, refresh our social skills, our curiosity, our capacity to play, and for families to really plan ahead and think about when you can have days that are off screens altogether how to go for long hikes and leave your phone at home, how to maybe have a weekend that's screen free, a week that's screen free. Because the, one of the things that we know for sure is that when we gather under the stars with the people we love the most, there is something about being together in nature that creates all those memories of family and safety and security in the world. And those are things that our children need now to refresh their own resilience and their capacity to deal with this very challenging situation. So I am now gonna take a question, let me see. Yes, good question. Um, it seems like parents need a digital reset too. How can we expect our children to do this if we're not willing or able to do so? I have, that's so important because parents absolutely need a digital reset. And in fact, one of the things I really recommend is when you sit down with your kids and think about the summer and think about schedules, ask them what's frustrating to them about you, about your availability and really listen and make sure that if at all possible, there are times throughout the day where you are with your kids and you are completely screen and device free. Because we know from research, even having a phone on the dinner table is distracting or on your desk is distracting. So having no devices and being with your children not only gives you a digital reset, but it tells your kids that they matter more to you than work or anything else. And that's been a hard time, a hard thing to convince our kids of these days when we're working at home. But we have to model uh, being screen free and going through our own withdrawal. And you can talk about how hard it is. Kids love to hear how you are struggling to get off your devices um, and, and really model for them. And the other thing that I would say is talk with your colleagues at work and really discuss how everybody is burned out, is languishing, is feeling really um, flatlined and think about maybe how you can have summer hours and carve out perhaps a little more time to be with your family and, and take care of yourselves. Okay, uh, we will have time for more questions or a few questions here, but now I'm going to introduce Dr. Alexis Loricella, I hope I said that right, who is an Associate Professor and Director of Technology in Early Childhood Center at the Erickson Institute. Her research focuses on children's learning from media and technology, from media technology and parents and teachers attitudes towards and the use of media technology. She also works with parents and teachers to connect research to practice. Alexis, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Catherine. I really appreciate that. Um, and I just want to share my screen and I want to um, quickly thank Pam and the team at um, Children and Screens for inviting me to participate today. I think this is a really important conversation and I'm glad that we're starting to talk about it now in April. Um, and I hope we continue to talk about it as many of my colleagues have mentioned, um, this is a transition and it's gonna, con every aspect continues to be a transition. And I think we really need to think about it in that way with all of our young children. Um, 
I want to start off with a little bit of data quickly. Um, this is just a study that we collected in the fall and winter of this academic school year. We surveyed 356 pre-K to third grade teachers and we asked them in this particular question, we asked them a lot of questions, but the one I want to present quickly here, uh, we asked them thinking about your students' experience during remote learning, how much do you think they're learning in the following areas compared to what they would have learned in the classroom? And so we have a scale from zero, which means significantly less than what they would have learned in the classroom, five being about the same and 10 being significantly more. And just to orient, orient you a little bit to this chart, um, the five is here, and I didn't go all the way up to 10 because of, not surprisingly, teachers weren't expecting kids to be learning significantly more necessarily this year. But what we found somewhat surprising and um, op kind of uh, uh, optimistic is, so here's the five, which is about the same. And we're seeing for certain factors like patience, media literacy, problem solving, independence, um, that these variables are considerably higher than that five, saying that kids are learning a little bit more than about the same as what they would have learned in the classroom. I also want to call your attention to what we in early childhood and, and education tend to talk about in terms of um, academic, academic skills. So things like literacy and math, it's hard to see, but these are even both above five two. Um, now, granted, these are teachers' perspectives. There is some selection bias into who's participating in this particular study. Um, but I think there's so much conversation and focus on the negative around this year that I want to bring some attention to the positives and to the opportunities and the things that we really have seen come out of this year. And that, frankly, some of the places where I hope we take what we learn from this year and adjust going into next year um, or into these transitions like we've been talking about. What we do know in terms of education and, and child success um, are things that things like executive functioning um, and these independent skills are particularly important in terms of predicting later academic success. And we're seeing teachers seeing improvements in these. And that is actually a really good sign, um, although it's not what anyone really wanted for this year. The outcomes of this year have changed children um, in a variety of ways. Of course, some in the good and some in, in the bad direction. But I want to recognize that we're not going back to school thinking that we have to completely catch up on everything and that this year was a total wash because there really are some opportunities here and I hope both educators and parents can begin to see it in that way. This comes back to this idea of what back to school means. Um, are we going back to school or is this something different? Has school changed? Have children changed? And do we need to kind of adjust to those changes to create, like we've said, a better transition to whatever is happening next in the school context. Um, as a developmental psychologist, I really focus on learning and how children learn. This year, we have taught our children how to learn in a very different way than they have learned for the last 100 plus years of our education system. We have required them to be very independent. We've required a lot of parent involvement that has not been required in the past. Um, and we need to recognize that we have just trained our children from pre-K through high school to do things differently this year. And so going back to school means that we're gonna either need to untrain them or retrain them. And we really need to recognize that even if we're talking about seniors who have had 12 years in our sort of traditional schooling system, we just changed their way of thinking and their way of learning and how are we going to readjust to that in this new school space. So again, I'm kind of pushing for this new framing of starting school. Um, even if we've got, again, seniors in high schools, going back to school is going to be different than it was in 2019. Under And, and to, to some of my colleagues' points, whenever there's some sort of extreme change in our schooling, we have to really think about this as starting over and refreshing what, we, what we're coming to this with. So whether we're talking about preschoolers or kindergartners or middle schoolers or high schoolers, I really encourage educators and parents to really take a moment to kind of retrain themselves to think about this as starting school. 
I know a lot of parents, I have kids at home myself, I'm excited about sending them back to school, but I have some work to do. I have to get them ready to go back into that building um, and to, for them to understand what it's gonna be like. So one thing I encourage parents to think about is how did you get your children ready for school the first time? How did you get your preschooler ready for kindergarten? How did you prepare your middle schooler to start middle school or even your high school or college student to go to that context? Let's bring back some of that framing and that attention and that energy so that we're talking about the new things in those places, whether or not you've got a, a third grader going back to the same building. Let's talk about transition. Let's talk about what they're excited about. Let's talk about what they're afraid of, what they expect to be the same and what they expect to be different. Because a lot of parents aren't doing that. They're just like, yay, school's open. See you later and sending them right back. And, and then of course we're seeing behavior problems. Of course we might be seeing expectations change. So something to think about is really kind of reframing our perspective um, about what we've expected of our kids for the last 13 months and what we expect and how we can help them move into this new space. So I'm pretty concrete. I like to really get to some tips. And so I, I pulled out some tips for educators specifically and this can be educators or administration. Um, I really encourage you to introduce school to children and families, not reintroduce, um, start from a, a fresh space and tell the families and the children what the expectations are, what school is gonna look like. Use technology, use visuals, use videos, walk children and families through the process of checking in, getting their temperature checked, what their classroom now looks like, what does it mean for lunchtime or gym time. Um, I really encourage schools to also um, avoid doing a complete 180, right? So you've been doing remote learning, you've been teaching in this context. I encourage you to take some of the things that you've been doing for the last whatever year, six months, however long it has been, and bring some of that into your classroom so that you're not completing a complete cut in how children have been taught to learn or, or engage in the last year. Um, please start communicating these changes early with your children and with your family so that they can start these conversations at home to get them ready to get back into school or to go to school. Um, and please, please be patient, please be kind, and please be understanding. Um, again, as a, as a family, a parent myself, um, some things have been way easier this year. Um, hairbrush hasn't always happened every morning, right? Teeth, getting teeth brushed hasn't always happened. Getting out the door at a certain time has definitely not happened. And so be, be patient and be kind with families as they have to readjust to a lot of uh, logistical changes that may have happened as a function of this year. Tips for parents. Um, and I said this in the beginning, but I really do want to kind of readjust our thinking of seeing this as a new and big transition. Um, just because school stopped abruptly doesn't mean that we need to start school abruptly. We should have some time and space to really transition back into this. Um, there will be new schedules, life with masks, frankly, a whole lot less social time. School was a very social space before, and most of these restrictions are limiting how and when children can engage and connect, which is really important for most children at school. Um, as parents, please ask questions of your school so that you are confident and comfortable with new procedures, expectations, so that again, you can trickle that back to your children and you can ask them about what's going on in these new situations at school. Please talk, talk, talk to your kids about going back. Um, remember to talk about the positives, right? So remember that this isn't all negative, that we've had a year potentially of being by each other's side, to be able to give a hug after a, a hard test or a hard exam, or um, to be able to have a snack together in the middle of the day. Those are a lot of positives that families have, se have seen um, that we can remember and we can, we can be positive about um, and be positive about going back to school. What's gonna be exciting? What's gonna be different? What's gonna be fun? I really encourage families, especially with young kids to practice the new routine, including the social expectations, Wearing a mask, um, one of the things we're seeing a lot with teachers is that young children um, don't always feel comfortable yelling and speaking louder when they have a mask on. Similarly, teachers don't quite recognize how loud they need to talk when they have a mask on for children to be able to hear them and understand them. So practice these things, especially with your young children. 
Um, I would also encourage, and this is actually unfortunately a universal, not just with young children, practice getting your kids used to socializing. Some of the anecdotal evidence that we've heard, um, even the example of pricking the finger and that fear around what that means, let's practice this stuff. How do we engage safely at school so that we don't get sick or, or spread germs, but also how do you talk to a new friend? How do you talk to somebody when you don't recognize them because they have grown in a year and are now wearing a mask covering half of their face? Um, so going to kind of re revert back to what you did when your young children were little. Um, we just did this with my three-year-old where we, we practiced three questions that she could ask a new friend because um, she has never done that. Her, she doesn't remember life before a mask. Um, and so we asked, okay, you know, we practiced. You can say, what is your name? How old are you? And we practiced, we role played it. What do you do, you know, when the little kid says back to you, what's your favorite color or whatever, right? But I really encourage parents to remember that this has been a whole year with all those very traditional practice and, and engagement and social experiences for these little ones. And again, recognize that it takes time for behavior change. Um, we can't expect to just dump a kid back into school and have things go back to whatever way we expected them to be. We need to really work with them to get to the places where we expect them to be. And the teachers and the parents need to work together to make sure that those expectations are clear and that yes, this is a new context. You don't get to lay in your bed during Zoom class anymore. You need to sit in your chair. You need to respond when the teacher asks you a question. You need to put your phone away. These are the new rules. This is the new context and we need to help you get there. On that note, especially around technology, um, in the same way that I think we're seeing our education system really not, it wasn't perfect before the pandemic, and it's not going to be perfect when we get back from the pandemic, there's a lot of conversation about how bad tech has been this year. Just a little heads up that people thought tech was pretty bad in 2019 also. And so I don't want to encourage parents to go back because it didn't feel like we had that very well under control then either. Um, so what I really want us to think about is how to move forward, um, how to take what we've learned and, and keep going in a way that actually is healthy and more productive in a variety of ways. So here's my, my media clip for the, for the presentation. But thinking about technology use and education in this way of let's go to infinity and beyond. What do we want to do next? What is the future? Let's stop looking back um, because that wasn't so great. How are we going to move forward in this new in this new transition? And so in regards to technology use, and this has come up in other people's presentations, but I want to highlight a couple of opportunities. So Mr. Rogers always told us to look for the helpers when talking about people. I actually think this is a really good phrase to think about with technology. There are a lot of places where tech has saved us um, emotionally, socially, educationally, um, in terms of health, everything in this way. And let's look at where there were the positives um, and see how that can be used and supported in the future. Um, in that same way, I really encourage parents and children to talk about their technology use. Let's reflect on it. Let's actually process it and think about it. Why do I pull my phone out um, the second that I step out the door and I'm by myself for a minute? Why do I why do I check my phone at the supermarket when I'm in a line? Let's talk about these and why are we doing it? And let's let's reflect on it. And hear from your kids too. They have different reasons, but that doesn't mean that their reasons are wrong. Um, similarly, I would really encourage you to take baby steps. Someone asked this in the last question. If, if adults can't do this, how can we expect it of our children? But let's all take some kind of like strong thought out intentional baby steps to create more healthier tech use for whatever that means for our families. Um, and then again, tech access has changed. Um, Many school districts have purchased internet. They've purchased one-to-one -one tech devices for children um, that they didn't have prior to this pandemic. How do we use that access? How do we use that connection to families? How do we use all of these technology tools in a way that again is more positive moving forward in our infinity and beyond kind of analogy rather than going backwards to stuff that didn't work so great before either. So I will pause here. I hope I didn't take too much time. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions. No, that was fabulous. Here's a question for you. 
how to scale back video game time and social media use specifically when they were the only social outlets during lockdown? I think this is a wonderful and really, really important question. And even in the question, you have some important key pieces of information. These were the only social outlets. And so I would encourage parents to be aware where they are, where children may be getting more social exposure. So if kids are now at soccer practice and at school and doing all these social things, is that A, enough social connection? Um, and as the child's perspective, from the student's perspective, um, how do we help them move to seeing real world social interaction as an equivalent to online social interaction? Again, the data pre-pandemic said that a lot of adolescents and college students were much more comfortable having social conversations, social interactions via a screen. Um, we saw fear and concern about ordering a pizza on the telephone. Um, and, and we saw adolescents engaging in more staying at home behaviors and connecting with social media instead of going to parties. We saw um, alcohol use going down. We saw sex, sexual activity going down. All these in-person social experiences were going down before the pandemic. And so this idea that just because now you can go hang out with your friends doesn't necessarily to the adolescent mind mean that that's what they want to be doing. And so we have to help them get back into that and we should have been helping them do that pre-pandemic and we, we kind of let that go in some ways. And so I would just say be very intentional and, and don't expect adolescents because the, the world allows them to be social outside, that that's what they prefer and that's what they want. And we need to have kind of more conversations and more supports in place um, and expectations in place for how to move out of that, out of that role. Um, Thank you, Alexis. You know, it makes me think about a teenager I had a conversation with who's just like your three-year-old who needed to needs to practice going to Starbucks and making eye contact and ordering a coffee because they are, have become so scared and, and unpracticed in the simple arts of just, you know, engaging socially. And this is a kid who had social anxiety before and is certainly enjoyed this aspect of the pandemic and now needs to practice again. The and new we all way. need to practice. I think, I think it's easy exactly with little right. kids because you know they don't know it yet. Um, but that's where I, the, the sort of reframing of the parent brain that we all, we all need this practice. We all need to get back on the, uh, in the swing of this. And so how do we help developmentally appropriately help all of these age groups do that in a very thoughtful way? Indeed. And we are going to hear more about how to do just that from Dr. Kathleen McGann. Uh, Dr. McGann has nearly three decades of experience as a pediatric infectious disease physician and over 20 years experience as an educator. She currently serves as the Vice Chair of Education in the Department of Pediatrics and Division of Infectious Diseases at the Duke University Medical Center. Thank you, Dr. McGann, for being with us. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I also want to really thank the Children and Screens uh, organization for inviting me and for all you do, um, which is truly awesome. Um, so I'm just going to start by talking about a Duke University and University of North Carolina initiative, which I'm part of that is going to help inform my discussion about um, transitioning out related to infectious diseases, specifically COVID-19 disease, because um, I think that's obviously a key aspect of the transition. So the ABC Science Collaborative was developed between scientists and physicians um, with along with school and community leaders to really help understand the most current and relevant information about COVID-19 and help uh, inform schools and the superintendents about reopening. So just taking a big picture step, let's look overall at COVID cases. These are new COVID cases reported in the United States. 
This is as of uh, yesterday uh, or maybe Monday. And what you can see here are our various surges that we've experienced. This was our big winter surge. And then there is a blip here, uh, which may indicate a fourth surge. It may not. Uh, there's a bit of debate about that and we're waiting to see what happens. We are concerned that with more and more variants being introduced into the United States, which is a normal part of this virus to mutate, um, that we may start seeing uh, a bit of a fourth surge. So we're waiting to see. I just wanted to talk first about some of the learning that we uh, undertook early on about both infections and outbreaks in the pandemic. Uh, we used information from hospitals um, and what happened within hospitals with respect to spread and other environments. So here you see um, to the far left that we actually saw marked transmission associated with childcare facilities in Utah early on before they started implementing mitigation measures. However, what we then noted was in Rhode Island, when they used mitigation measures, even though cases in the community were up, it did not mean cases in schools um, because we did not see spread within schools and childcare settings. Um, which was really exciting. And the other thing we learned, I actually love this example um, from the CDC, um, is that masking really works. Uh, this shows two uh, hairstylists who had 139 clients. Both the stylists and the clients were masked. Those stylists ended up developing COVID-19 disease but none of their um, contacts, their work contacts, so they're the people whose hair they did, um, developed disease. So super exciting and demonstrating that masking works. And then um, I just wanted to say that when we think about schools, schools are, it's very important that schools have a plan and protocols. And what we've learned from infectious diseases in general, and certainly from COVID, is this sort of Swiss cheese uh, defense against respiratory viruses. And what we've recognized is that no single intervention is uh, perfect at preventing spread. And so we have multiple approaches that improve our success. And these include the things you've been hearing a lot about during this pandemic. So distancing, ventilation when possible, masking, and I mean a good fit of the mask, hand hygiene, and then testing contact tracing uh, when there are individuals who are ill or who have exposed others. So now I just wanted to launch into some reassuring data about schools reopening when they adhere to the three W's. Um, so early, early on, um, schools closed down, as you, as you all know, um, in mid-March uh, through June for most schools because of the concern that schools might spread disease. But in fact, uh, we learned over time that schools aren't responsible for being super spreaders. And in fact, uh, data from China, France, Australia demonstrated that SARS-CoV-2 transmission in schools is much less important in contributing to community transmission than, than we initially feared. And then data within the US, this article came out in late January, talking about both the data and policy to guide safe reopening of schools and limiting the spread of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And um, I quote from their article, the preponderance of available evidence has been reassuring. The rapid spread seen in other settings has not been reported in schools. And I wanna go over a couple of um, studies that highlight this. The first is actually our study that we did here in North Carolina through the ABC Science Collaborative in the fall. We had 11 school districts with more than 90,000 students and staff, and they were open for in-person education for the first nine weeks that first quarter. Um, and I do want to take a step back and just say that we know individuals are going to come into school with SARS-CoV-2 infection or COVID-19 infection. Um, we know that because there's community spread. Our big goal within schools is to prevent within school transmission. 
Ideally, we would see less community spread also, but our goal with schools is to prevent within school transmission. So during this time, within school transmissions were actually rare. There were 773 individuals that came into school uh, with community acquired infections, but only 32 infections were acquired within school. And there were no cases of student to staff transmission. Now, normally with the rate of spread in most communities, we would have expected about 800 infections due, due to those 773. So 32 is remarkably low. Most of the cases of secondary transmission and all three clusters were actually related to lack of face coverings. Uh, Mississippi also did a study looking at exposures among children 0 to 18 years of age with and without SARS-CoV-2 infection, and they found increased risk of infection was associated with having attended gatherings and social functions outside the home and having had visitors, but not associated with in-person school attendance during the 14 days prior to diagnosis, the time of incubation. And this is a nice infographic um, about the CDC's um, from the CDC about the Missouri data, really, again, driving home that children who attended gatherings, and we see this parties, birthday parties, uh, weddings, funerals, playdates are more likely to have tested positive, but not those who, who attended childcare or were um, in in person school. And then the other uh, study I want to highlight was from Wisconsin, rural Wisconsin, um, where the CDC reported on data from 17 K through 12 schools who had very high mask adherence. And they reported uh, the COVID-19 incidence was notably lower in schools than in the community. And they looked at 13 weeks in the fall of 2020, where there were 191 COVID-19 cases in staff and students. And again, those are community cases, but only seven in-school transmissions. And this uh, is a nice graphic that just shows you the cases in Wood County and then the cases that walked into school from community spread and the markedly low within school spread, uh, super reassuring. And really a lot, this was attributed to their terrific mask adherence. And I do wanna take a step back and say that in our experience, stu students are awesome. The children are awesome about wearing masks. You make it fun for them, you role model it well, and students are really excited about wearing masks, especially little guys like these guys, if you can make the masks fun. So we've been very impressed at that. And it is often the adults um, that we have to really work on uh, with masking in the school setting and outside. So just to summarize, this, these studies demonstrate high rates of COVID-19 in the community do not mean increased secondary transmission within schools. And I do want to say we have another study coming out shortly looking at the winter surge when cases were very high in, in most of our communities. And similarly, we found markedly low transmissions within schools. Schools can mitigate within school virus transmission when students and staff consistently wear masks, use hand hygiene and practice distancing. Um, schools are really doing a good job of protecting students and staff, which is awesome. I'm not gonna go into detail about this because I think other webinars have talked about the major educational and health impacts from the pandemic. But we know beginning of grades, school scores, course failures, dropout rates are increasing. And then there's a lot of mental health um, and other issues associated with this pandemic and further uh, emphasizes the goal to um, get us back to normal as, as soon as we possibly can. The CDC did note because of their critical role for all children and the disproportionate impact that school closures can have on those with the least economic means, K through 12 schools should be the last settings to close and the first to reopen when they can do so safely. I'm going to uh, just also quickly highlight there's additional data many more studies than I could possibly go through, but from multiple states, Europe, Australia, emphasizing again, low transmission within schools when mitigation strategies are followed appropriately. And then I just wanna briefly talk about the variants that we know are out there. 
Um, so what does a more contagious virus mean for schools? Young children um, are, were about half as likely as adults to transmit the variant to others, um, which was true of the original virus. Variants nevertheless spread more easily among both children and adults. And it's estimated that some of these new variants, the British, uh, the UK one, the South African one, can be anywhere from 30 to 80% more contagious than the original virus. Um, in the US, we've talked about mutant viruses are starting to spread. The key with variants that I wanna make here, the key point is to remain vigilant with masking, distancing, and hand hygiene. Those same mitigation strategies that work with the variants, were, that worked with the regular virus, work with the variants. And then you may ask, when are we gonna be back to normal? So Dr. Fauci said, uh, rather than concentrating on an elusive number, uh, like the herd immunity we'd been talking about earlier, let's get as many people vaccinated as quickly as we can. So the more individuals who are protected and vaccinated, the better. We have decreased number of infections, which leads to decreased viral spread, which leads to decreased morbidity and mortality from this virus. So we have an ongoing sense of urgency to vaccinate before the variants surge. So let's talk a little bit about vaccination. Again, these are quick overviews given the time, but there are, this compares four SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. You've heard a lot about the Pfizer and Moderna, which use the same mechanism of action, their mRNA vaccines, and had surprisingly terrific efficacy or protection against disease, 94 and 95% relatively. Um, Johnson & Johnson we'll talk a little bit more about, but again, high protection from severe disease and moderate to severe disease. And AstraZeneca is actually not rolled out here in the States. And I just want to emphasize that 16 and up um, have been approved by an EUA for the Pfizer vaccine. So how does vaccine look in the US? Um, the rollout has been going quite well overall, um, but we still have work to do. 85 million one dose uh, recipients and 132.3 have received two doses. Um, and you'll see that we are hoping by the summer, we will have a preponderance of adults immunized. How do we know vaccines are safe? We look at clinical trials and long-standing post-licensure systems. And we know there are side effects from these uh, mRNA vaccines. Uh, it, the side effects are actually thought related to our great immune response and protection. There are some rare events that are noted that I'm not going to have time to go into in detail, but we're being very careful about those. And the exciting thing is we have new data up to six months after the second dose of the mRNA vaccine showing 91% ongoing protection. Uh, briefly, I'm going to mention the J&J &J vaccine um, that those vac vaccinations were paused due to cerebral blood clots and low platelets in six women who received the vaccine. That was six out of 6.85 million vaccinations. I do wanna put that in context of when other in higher incidence settings of clots with COVID disease itself, we see a uh, very high incidence, birth control pills, smoking, and other risk factors for clots, just to put that in, in perspective per million. And the, the really good thing about this is the robust vaccine safety surveillance system has picked this up. They put the vaccine on pause. The ACIP um, is currently the Immunization Practices Committee reviewing the data and has another meeting planned for this Friday with several possible results in their recommendations, which I've outlined here. I just want to quickly talk about um, pediatric uh, vaccines. So currently in younger children, we're doing dosing studies to um, see what dose is appropriate for both protection um, and side effects. And then we will roll out larger enrollments. So why vaccinate children? They comprise 23 to 25% of our population, and we want to protect children also. They too have had, had disease, not near as much as adults and older adults, but they've suffered morbidity and mortality from um, COVID. 
Current predictions about when the vaccines will be available. Um, the Pfizer vaccine is currently under an EU uh, uh, request for an EUA. And so 12 to 15 year olds um, may be able to receive the vaccine as early as this summer. The data looks incredibly protective and quite good in them. And then the younger children later in the winter and maybe early 2022. Um, and this is just the rollout of the vaccines in children. Um, and again, the uh, emergency youth author authorization that's been requested and hopefully we'll hear more either the end of this month or in May. And then um, just in summary, I know there's a whirlwind tour through infection um, and SARS-CoV-2, but in summary, SARS-CoV-2 is not going away anytime soon. Schools are a safe environment for children and teachers if mitigation strategies are followed. We all, I know we are all really tired of wearing masks and hand hygiene and distancing, but we have to continue to be vigilant when we're seeing this blip in cases with masking, distancing, hand hygiene. And again, I really want to encourage vaccination. Um, it's really important to decrease spread locally and globally. I was fortunate to get my first one on December 24th. It was my Christmas gift. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just want to thank you all again and uh, am happy to answer questions. Oh, thank you, Cami. One quick question. How often should teachers or students themselves wipe down their desks and the shared spaces in schools? Yeah, so this is really interesting. And the CDC is probably going to change their more vigilant cleaning recommendations. There have not been very many case reports of fomite spread. So that means spread from if I touch a pen and give it to somebody else, much more likely to spread through the respiratory route, so through droplets. That said, if somebody's going to share a pen or share a piece of chalk or, um, or wipe down their desk, then I would wipe down, if the child's still using the desk, they can continue using it. But if, they're, if another child's going to sit in the desk, I would recommend wiping that desk down. Similarly, if you're gonna share a pen, please hand sanitize and wipe down the pen. We are trying to, even though I've said fomite spread is very uncommon, we are trying to encourage people to avoid sharing <clears throat> when possible. I know we like kids to learn sharing, but this is not the time to learn uh, to share things like pens and that type of thing and to use their own and keep their own crayons, pens, that type of thing whenever possible. So helpful interested to hear what these new regulations are going to be as we continue to learn more. Thank you so much. Um, really actually a very reassuring and optimistic uh, report today from you. Thank you. So now we're going to shift over to general um, Q&A and discussion. And um, let's see, I'm going to start off with one question that's already come in. And that's how do we help to support marginalized families do all this when they don't have the means, either financial emotional or time-wise. Anybody want to jump at that? Maybe Alexis? I can jump in. I think this is a really critical conversation and unfortunately one that is not being talked about in a lot of these spaces and is not coming up explicitly that we are seeing massive divides again um, in terms of education and resources, time, mental health, all of these uh, variables between uh, based on families and their status, whether they're um, both, both parents are working out of the house, whether we're talking about income. Um, and we, I think from an education standpoint and a kind of just general standpoint need to be having these conversations. And I'm hopeful that we can begin to provide kind of disproportionate support to those who need more time and effort. And so I, I think some school districts have begun to do this in the way that they've invited children back into the classroom and who's been invited back at, at different rates to provide more support for families who might need it. So if there isn't a parent at home, those children might get to go back to school before everybody gets to go back and, the, and providing um, kind of district-wide care uh, so that kids could do remote learning in a context where they're cared for. Um, 
I don't have an answer, but I think what we need to just be very aware of is that people, certain families are going to need more support and we should be putting more support out so that so that individual parents don't need to be taking all of that load. Uh, another kind of asterisk there is to be careful for what that looks like and to not be stereotyping and making assumptions because um, again, we don't really have a good feel for what families' life have been like this year. And so those who may not land into categories that we've traditionally seen as needing more supports may still be needing more support this year um, for a variety of reasons because of COVID. So um, I can start there. Thanks. David, I'm wondering what you've seen schools do either after 9-11 or Katrina. We know there's going to be a huge or maybe not huge, but a significant increase in the mental health needs of kids for a variety of different kinds of grief and loss, as you so you know, wisely clarified and differentiated for us. Can you tell us about anything you see going on on a national level or how we're gonna address these increased uh, mental health needs supports for children in the years ahead? Well, I think there are a couple of things that we can do and already is being done in many school districts. One is trying to increase the skills and comfort level of all staff. Mm -hmm. um, so that would include classroom educators, but really support staff too. I, I did a webinar for the School Nutrition Association because people who worked in the cafeteria said, we wanna know how to help kids. We used to hug them, we can't do that, what can we do? So I think we need to have everyone feel more comfortable providing what I, it's often referred to as psychological first aid. Just how, how are you supportive? How are you helpful to people who are in distress? That's a skill everyone in a school system should have, regardless of whether we're in a pandemic. But I also am seeing now some infusion of funds to states that can be used specifically for increasing both mental health staffing as well as resources to providing mental health. So, um, you know, after 9 11, and we worked closely with New York City schools, they had free mental health in every school throughout the school system. And early in the pandemic, I was saying, I don't anticipate we're going to see that level of funding for every school in the country. But actually, in the current administration, there is some effort effort to, to do some of that. So I think it's it's coupling uh, general preparedness and skill set and, and making sure we level the field so everyone interacting with the child knows how to be supportive um, and then providing additional services to those who, who would benefit from it. That's great. You know, I too have been working with schools and one of the things I'm seeing schools doing is shifting schedule and time to do both more training for teachers and social emotional tools and to make accommodations in the calendar. So advisories, extended time. So kids are learning more social emotional tools for self-regulation and also DEI tools, difficult conversations, how to talk about the political moment that is also a source of so much stress and, and anxiety and fear in kids right now. So I think people are really beginning to think that when we think about the core curriculum and what matters, we have to really revision what are the tools kids need to be psychologically and, and socially equipped to, to learn together in the world they're living in right now. And it is a very different world than anything we've ever seen before. Okay, should, ah, Cami, I think this is for you. Should schools be enforcing quarantine after exposure? And how do you do this in a supportive way that doesn't overburden teachers? Yeah, so the, the current recommendation is that if there's an exposure um, and, and so it varies depending on the state, but if there is a definitive exposure, then those who were exposed do have to be quarantined for either the seven days if a test is done, 10 days if asymptomatic and being followed carefully, or the full 14 days. So it gets a little confusing in there. We are very hopeful with some of our new data that we're going to be able to demonstrate that if both, for example, the teacher and the child were masked and there was an exposure that you really can do not need to quarantine as vigilantly as we have been. But that is really not ready for prime time yet because um, we're waiting for the CDC 
to um, come out with recommendations about quarantine based on data that we're accumulating now. Um, what we are seeing is that the vast majority of those exposed are not developing disease, especially when the child and the teacher are masked. Um, so hopefully that will change, but right now those quarantines do are, are still happening and need to happen. Thank you. This is within school transmissions, obviously. And another related question, um, how can lunch be considered safe when it's unmasked and windows are closed? And how can we create social opportunities to replace things like lunchtime that are traditionally social? So that's an awesome question. We actually have recommendations on our website about lunch because that is that was frankly, where we were seeing spread in hospitals, between nurses in break rooms, we were seeing it um, with staff at school in break rooms. Um, so we have some pretty, uh, pretty strong uh, opinions about how to do lunch safely. We recommend that people are six feet apart. We're lucky because we're in North Carolina, so the weather isn't, uh, is, has been pretty mild overall. We really encourage kids to have lunch outside if possible, where, um, where there's less uh, exposure to each other. Um, we ask them to be six feet apart. The other thing we've asked children to do is to stay masked, to prepare their lunch, put their straws in their milk, unwrap their sandwich, get everything ready, still masked, eat in silence, which I realize is really hard, but most kids eat in five to 10 minutes super quickly put their mask back on and then they can chat and socialize. So that's what we've been recommending and the questioner is exactly right. The, the, that is a high risk time is during eating when masks are down. Um, so we've, we've had some pretty strong recommendations that are again on our website. Um, okay, well, thank you. Anything else anybody wants to say? My colleagues up here that you're what last thought you want to offer or last tip you might want to offer? I just think on that note too, just rethinking when the social times in the school space are. So they've been traditionally been lunch and recess, but that doesn't mean they have to be the only times. And so if we're hearing very clearly that masked socialization is probably the safest to try to encourage teachers to find spaces for that to happen so that lunch can be the rushed, get your food down, um, and just eat situation. I, I love to hear that. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. David, one last thought from you. Well, one of the things that I would just say to parents in particular is something that was already mentioned. Just because we don't know everything to do doesn't mean we don't know anything. It doesn't mean we haven't done something of value. So this is actually an opportunity to focus on what you can do uh, with your child within the limitations that you have, particularly over the summer. And um, I would say we, we probably should be focusing less on what we can't do. Um, it's unfortunate. I'm not trying to minimize the loss. We certainly have to acknowledge it, but we don't have to dwell on it. Um, kids do have the capacity, you know, everybody keeps saying, well, they miss graduation. Children have missed graduation before. Some kids actually chose not to go. Some people travel out of the country around graduation time. It, it, children will adapt to most of those changes. Um, so again, I think we have to focus on what we can do and, um, and not focus so much on what was lost, but acknowledge the losses that did occur. So I'm just gonna lift up that message and say two things. Um, the first one is that this generation has, and this sounds Pollyanna-ish, but I really do believe it, is having an experience where they are going to develop the capacity for resilience born out of a horrible experience. But when we look at the life skills that people need to thrive, resilience is way high up there. And kids have been challenged and they're gonna come through this in ways that they never would have had the opportunity to actually learn. And as David said, kids miss years of school because they're sick or their family circumstances change and they have to repeat a year, they will come through this. And the last thing I wanna add is that when we look at the research on who thrives in a pandemic or who thrives in a crisis, 
um, the blitz, it was one of the things that comes out over and over again, that creates resilience and optimism in children during very stressful times, is a consistent connection to a calm parent who holds optimism in the face of a lot of scary stuff going on around you. So in, when the bombs were falling, it was the mom or the grandma who said, okay, grab your books, we're going down into the shelter. Not the one who said, ah, you know, there are more bombs. You're thinking, ah, we're hearing all the research we've heard today. But as parents and educators, it is so important that we communicate to our kids, whether they're our students, our children, and certainly to the people who are depending on us, a sense of optimism, we're in this together, and we are going to get through this together. And I'm going to introduce, reintroduce Pam, who has helped all of us get through this together through this wonderful series. Pamela, wrap it up for us, please. Thank you, Catherine, David, Alexis, and Kathleen for sharing your insights, foresight, experience, and truly outstanding advice. Uh, to all of us. And as we go through this uncertain time, the tools you provided us, no doubt, will make this transition much, much smoother. Thanks to all of you, our Zoom participants, for joining us. To continue learning about this topic, be sure to visit our website at childrenandscreens.com and read our tips for parents and other resources. Uh, we'll post a video of today's webinar on our YouTube channel, uh, to which we encourage you all to subscribe and share with your fellow parents, teachers, clinicians, researchers, and friends. For more from Children's Screens, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at the account shown on your screen. In addition, please keep an eye out for the results from three studies about digital media use and outcomes that uh, during COVID that Children's Screens began funding at the start of the pandemic. These studies extended and extend ongoing longitudinal research to allow us to investigate how digital media use changed in the midst of the pandemic and what this digital media use means for children, adolescents, academic, social, social emotional, psychological, and physical health outcomes. This data will be hugely important as we continue to react to data and transition out of the pandemic in healthy ways. Our conversation addressing children's well-being and digital media will continue on Wednesday, May 5th when we discuss young people's engagement in civic activities and participatory politics, both on and offline. When you leave the workshop, you'll see a link to a short survey. Please click on the link and let us know what you thought of the webinar. Thanks for joining us today. Everyone, be safe and well. <laughs>